Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest here in Austin, Texas, and uh, have been in recovery for the past 50 years and started this uh, podcast series, uh, gosh, I guess about three years ago. The idea behind it is to try to go deeper into the spirituality, the, the history and the psychology of uh, the 12-step program. So glad you're joining us. If, uh, if you are new, I'd invite you to go and visit our website. It is titled Two-Way Prayer, T-W-O, and you'll see there a video. We recorded it uh, earlier this year, and it gives the basic instructions on, on how, to, how to do the practice, and there's a set of handouts that go along with that. We're also putting these uh, podcasts onto YouTube now, so if you'd like to visit there, you, you can do it. Uh, Go to Father Bill W. or go to Two Way Prayer. I, I think both will get you there. Doing a new series. This is this should be the final episode on that. It's a book that I'm working on. It's uh, an opportunity to go deeper into oh instructions and background uh, and samples of Two Way Prayer. Started off as a booklet, but it's it's getting a little, a little heavier than than I had uh, thought. We, we, we've done three or four episodes on the book so far, and, and that's part one of the book. And it's really, uh, that, that's the set of instructions. This is now moving into part two, and I'm only going to do one episode on this because that's, that's all I've finished so far anyway. Maybe later on we'll do a little uh, further digging. Uh, but part two is, is definitely going deeper. This first chapter in part two is titled Entering the Fourth Dimension of Consciousness. And this chapter is my best shot at uh, exploring what is the nature of spiritual transformation. We use different words for it, psychic change, conversion experience, but it all kind of means the same thing. It's that change that needs to happen for a full recovery to come about. And in this chapter, I'm going to look at it from three perspectives. As I think if we examine it uh, from in some different directions, it might help us understand what, what, what is not an easy uh, subject to, uh, to get, all right? So I'm going to look at it from Bill Wilson's perspective, because uh, he underwent a psychic change in Towns Hospital. Uh, we'll look at that uh, personal experience basically then we'll look at william james whose book wilson read uh right after his uh psychic change uh, or hot flash as he called it in in town sauce he read that book and it gave him an understanding of what was happening to him he figured well i guess i'm not going crazy here's this harvard psychologist who's written a whole book about the kind of thing that I just experienced. And then we're going to go into some real depth looking at um, the work of Robert Johnson, who for me is an interpreter of Carl Jung. Carl Jung kind of started this thing, sent uh, Roland Hazard uh, in search of a psychic change. He said, I can't help you anymore, but uh, if you have one of these things, I think you'll get it. And that's what happened. He went to the Oxford group and underwent uh, a change of some depth and was able to then stay sober. Again, uh, different names, but whether it's spiritual awakening, conversion experience, psychic change, the big book even talks about it uh, as entering the fourth dimension of existence. I always liked that one, you know? It's, uh, it's, like, it's like you're going through some doors here that are going to take you to a wholly new place. Uh, but I really believe this is psychological, but not psychological in the sense of um, explaining it away. But I think we're now entering an age where psychology and spirituality are coming together because uh, it, it's going to take looking at it from both sides uh, to appreciate what change is really all about uh, and this fourth dimension of existence. So Wilson uh, was convinced that uh, 
wh whether it came about gradually or or suddenly, it was the kind of in-depth experience that a person needed to have if they were going to overcome their alcoholism. Let, let's start with Wilson's experience, and uh, I'm going to read it. It's uh, one that you're maybe not as familiar with. He, he's told this story many, many times. Uh, I'm going to put all of the quotes here uh, into the show notes, so you should be able to access them at the end of this. This is from his autobiography. Uh, it was a tape recording that he did of his first 40 years. So he writes about, uh, about what, what happened to him in Towns Hospital. He said, the terrifying darkness had become complete. In agony of spirit, I again thought of the cancer of alcoholism, which had now consumed me in mind and spirit and soon the body. But what of the great physician? I remember saying to myself, I'll do anything, anything at all. If there be a great physician, I'll call on him. Then, with neither hope nor faith, I cried out, If there be a God, let him show himself. The effect was instant, electric. Suddenly my room blazed with an incredible white light. I was seized with an ecstasy beyond description. I have no words for this. Every joy I had known was pale by comparison. The light, the ecstasy, I was conscious of nothing else for a time. Then, seen in the mind's eye, there was a mountain. I stood on its summit, where a great wind blew, a wind not of air, but of spirit. In great clean strength, it blew right through me. Then came the blazing thought, you are a free man. I know not how long I remained in this state, but finally the light and the ecstasy subsided. I again saw the wall of my room. As I became more quiet, a great peace stole over me. And this was accompanied by a sensation difficult to describe. I became acutely conscious of a presence which seemed like a veritable sea of living spirit. I lay on the shores of a new world. Encounters with the divine. And that's what Wilson was doing his very best to describe there. Um, they can change people. They can change us at the deepest levels of our consciousness. It shakes up the ego, uh, puts it into um, a new space that wasn't available to it before, and, and, and really presents kind of a new world. Um, and and we're, we're going to get into this in, in some real depth here. And this was the kind of uh, change experience that Jung had uh, sent Roland Hazard to go searching for. I think there's less dramatic examples of it. And I really believe this is what happens to us in a less dramatic form, oftentimes, in two-way prayer. And, that, and that's why I'm so excited about it. I mean, I, I've been sober for 50 years. I worked as a counselor and family therapist for a long, long time. And my job was to help alcoholics experience something that was better than alcohol or drugs. This encounter with the divine, uh, which requires the emptying of the ego, is the best thing I ever found for helping people to undergo a transformation of real depth. So what happens in this uh, encounter, uh, and, and this is what happens in two-way prayer, I believe the unconscious mind breaks through into consciousness. And I think we're hardwired for that. And, and, and ha it's happened for eons. As long as people have been around, it's happened. In the old days, it came through visions, paying attention to dreams. In Native American culture, they were sent on vision quests. Uh, fasting helps to bring it about. Rites of passage in, in many, many different cultures. And for us, for the modern age, I think it's what the 12-step journey is all about. 
it's a journey going in search of a psychic change. I mean, step 12 says what? Uh, originally, it said having had a spiritual experience. And Wilson wanted to go back to that, not just a more tepid version of an awakening. He said, I liked experience. And I think that's what people are searching for. Give us an experience of the divine. It, it's powerful. It's, it's, it, it can shake you up. And that, that's why I really kind of wanted to end at uh, part one of the book and call it a day. Well, there it is. But I, I couldn't do that. I mean, I, I've just gone deeper with this thing and explored it at greater depth. Come what may, I'm, I'm throwing it out there to the world. So th this is the best uh, I've been able to come up with. Um, so I think spiritual experiences are um, more common than uh, we let on. People are uh, cautious about sharing them uh, with other people, and yet they are really profound. So that's what uh, Wilson had. He wanted to communicate that to other people and uh, spent the majority of his life uh, trying to do exactly that. Let's look now at William James um, on psychic change. Uh, as I said, uh, soon after Wilson had his experience, Ebby brought him a book uh, titled Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And what it was, was a study of a, a good number of psychic phenomena that had happened and were recorded throughout history. And James took these seriously, studied them, analyzed them. Uh, was there things that, were there things that were common to these? And, and a number of the case studies that he did in that book uh, were of alcoholics. Um, I think there were two that I, that I recall that were had to make a profound impact on Bill Wilson reading them. I'm not going crazy. This this is this is how it happened to me, and how it happened to me, and how it happens to the next person are going to be different, uh, but but the results are going to be the same. So let's jump into into William James. He was uh, his book was popular in the Oxford group. And Wilson was being introduced to the Oxford group through Ebby. So it's very natural that he would have brought him this book uh, in detox. In James's book, and I did a whole series on this. Um, maybe we'll try to link that in the show notes as well with uh, um, Paul in Barcelona, uh, who did a, a marvelous book on William James and, uh, and AA. It's it's really, really, uh, James is not easy to read. Uh, Carl Jung is not easy to read. And um, I like people who can kind of give us that information and break it down into words that we can understand. And that's what Paul tried to do in, in his book. I think did a good job. Here's William James's definition. He gives a definition of uh, psychic change. Basically, he calls it a conversion experience when somebody undergoes uh, a tremendous change. He says, to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance are so many phrases which denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which a self, hitherto divided and consciously wrong, inferior, and unhappy, that's us, it becomes unified and consciously right, superior, and happy. And here's the key. In consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities not religious theology, but realities, an experience of the reality. So James is describing here exactly, I think, what the big book calls a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And that's what we're seeking to, uh, to experience through the 12 steps and hopefully to enhance through the practice of uh, two-way prayer. So let's, uh, let's break this down uh, and, and go through it line by line and, 
see if we can make a little bit more sense of it. And again, I'll put the quote in the show notes. I've got about 10 points here. We'll go try to go through these quickly. He's talking about an in-depth personality change, and he says it can be called by many different names. But each name describes a very similar process, and the process can be sudden or gradual. Uh, and that's why they put that little excerpt in the back of the big book. It can be sudden or gradual. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a dramatic kind of thing. But the results are always the same. It brings about change. Changes at the very deepest levels of self. And we're going to talk about self. Because when you're talking about psychology, you're going you're gonna to have to understand what is this consciousness of self and, and we will get into that in some real depth here so it brings about a change in the self and as a direct result james says what had been a divided self a self that felt alienated miserable disconnected disconnected from what from its source from life from people disconnected from the true self who who we really are you know the there's a lovely line that that wilson used he said we know loneliness like few other people do we alcoholics we are alone we are cut off cut off from life cut off from the source of life and that's what has to be reestablished so it has to get changed. So it shifts from being wrong, divided, and unhappy to being, and here I'll use Wilson's words, to being happy, joyous, and free. How? Why? By firmer holds on religious realities, on this fourth dimension. This fourth dimension is not now a set of beliefs, it becomes a lived experience and you can't deny the experience you can't maybe define the experience you can't explain it like wilson couldn't explain it he could just say i was like i was on a mountaintop wind not not of air but of spirit was blowing through me but i knew at some very deep level that i was free now and what does he mean he mean he had undergone a transformation and he knew it he knew it where is this great reality, you know? It, it, it's, it's contact, again, with the numinous, with the sacred, with the transcendent. Big Book says, this great reality is not out there. It's in here. The great reality is within. It's the deepest, the most life-affirming, life-connecting part of ourselves. It's, it's an experience of the soul, of who we truly are, you know? And... Uh, and we got to go inside. Modern people uh, kind of poo-poo this idea, you know? Uh, it, it's, it's not in vogue. Here, here's a guy, another guy who's helping. He's, he's even deeper, and, and we'll, maybe we'll do, maybe do a series on him sometime, but he helped me more than anybody. Uh, his name is Edward Edinger, a Jungian uh, psychoanalyst, head of the Jung Society, and New York, and I think in also in Los Angeles, uh, one of the best interpreters of Carl Jung. A nice quote about this religious realities. He said, the modern ego, ego is so conditioned to take personal responsibility for everything that happens to it, that it is hard for modern man to recognize religious realities, even when hit over the head with them. Religious realities mean realities which are derived from an inner, purposeful, non-ego origin. It's an experience of my center, not being centered in self, but in cent centered now in something greater than self difficult concept, okay? And, and this is where Robert Johnson uh, can be very helpful. Uh, Johnson uh, studied under Jung, 
written a number of books. Um, they're very short, simple, uh, but power packed books. And one that I came across a number of years ago was called Transformation. And in it, I, I, I must have read this passage a hundred times, trying to understand what it is Johnson was trying to communicate. Because I think he's taking this concept from uh, William James and putting it into language that uh, hopefully we can understand. I'm going to read it through uh, and, and then we're going to go back and analyze it kind of line by line. So let, let me read it. And this is, this is how do you shift from three dimensional to four dimensional consciousness? So hang on, here we go. For most people, the transition from three dimensional to four dimensional consciousness is exceedingly painful. Medieval Christianity called it the dark night of the soul. Dante called it the journey through hell. It was 40 days and 40 nights in the desert for Jesus. It was a journey in the belly of the fish for many a hero. This is not new stuff. This has been going on for as long as people have been on this planet. You know, that, that they have an experience of something beyond them that is in relationship to them. For a modern man, it is a midlife crisis or worse, a nervous breakdown or still worse, physical suicide. The process can be summed up in one sentence. I love one sentences. It is the relocating of the center of the personality from the ego to a center greater than one's self. This shift in consciousness is moving from being self-centered to being God-centered, other-centered. All right. This super personal center has been variously called the self with a capital S, the self. It's been called the Christ nature, the Buddha nature, super consciousness, cosmic consciousness, Satori and Samadhi. All of the different faith traditions maybe have different language, different names for it but they're pointing to something very, very similar. This relocation appears to be death when viewed from the perspective of the ego. <laughs> there, there's the poor little ego. Oh my God, I'm dying. I'm dying. Zen masters observe that Satori, their term for a non-personal center of consciousness, Satori, can be viewed by the ego as nothing but total disaster. And death it is. The ego loses its supremacy. It loses its central position in the psyche and goes through a short time of violent suffering. When someone threatens suicide at this time, I caution him that he must be very careful to do it without harming his body. What Johnson is saying is, and maybe we'll get to this in a minute, but, but what he's saying is, is, is the inclination to want to kill oneself. And, and many of us have had that thought, desire, stop the pain for God's sakes, you know? I'm going to kill myself. Well, what Johnson is saying is, well, that's right. But it's the wrong self. <laughs> it's the ego self that you want to kill because it's so damn painful being me. And what he's saying is, okay, there's a way to stop being you and start being something else. All right. The relocation of the center of the personality is a form of suicide and it's best done by the ego. A Zen master in Los Angeles once said to his client, why don't you die now and enjoy the rest of your life? 
<laughs> always like that one. There's a little bit more to Johnson's quote, and but I think this is enough to uh, chew on for a while. So let's let's start breaking this down. All right. So I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go through it line by line and uh, see if we can make a little bit more sense of it. Johnson writes, for most people, the transition from three-dimensional to four-dimensional consciousness is exceedingly painful. Medieval Christianity called it the dark night of the soul. Dante called it the journey through hell, 40 days, 40 nights in the desert for Jesus. It was a journey in the belly of the fish for many a hero. So again, moderns have, have lost uh, both belief in and contact with spirit world that medieval faith traditions just took for granted. All right? And we are paying a hell of a price for that. Trust me. And it's real difficult. It's like I can't go back to the naive way that they thought about it. I have to find a new way to experience it. But experience it, I must. And, um, and it can get kind of lonely uh, as you're journeying. That's why it was, it's so helpful to find people who take this stuff seriously and have been there, experienced it, and are trying their best to talk about it. And Johnson is one of those guys. I mean, he had some real pain growing up. Alcoholic father lost his leg in a car accident. He knew pain and he knew loneliness and he knew the inner world. And that's what we're searching for here. It's, it's like we need some geographers who can give us a map of what the hell is going on inside of us at depth. That's what we're looking for. So these deep spiritual experiences have been happening for as long as humankind has been around. They don't happen to everyone, but certain people uh, do have direct encounters with the divine. And as a result of that, they are rewarded with heightened or changed levels of consciousness. Pain is often helpful in bringing about this kind of spiritual breakthrough. And this ought to come as really good news for those of us in recovery because we've likely experienced our own journeys through hell. We've spent our own time wandering, lost in the wilderness. Uh, and we found ourselves trapped in the belly of many a beast, right? <laughs> so we know of, of what Johnson is speaking here, all right? That this, 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 this alcoholism, this drug addiction, this addiction of any kind, is going to squeeze us to depths that um, are going to shake up our consciousness. And it's dangerous, it's painful, but it, it, can, it can lead to a breakthrough. And that's what Johnson's going to talk, start talking to us about. He says, for a modern man, it is a midlife crisis. Is this all there is? Or worse, a nervous breakdown? or still worse, physical suicide. Mine came at age 27. I couldn't go on living the way I was living. And, and I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. I was going crazy. What it was, was the collapse of the ego system that I had put together. It couldn't withstand it any longer. And so it broke, like a fever breaking. Now, it's dangerous, but it's also an opportunity for, for the shift to really begin to happen. And, and, and I think that is what began to happen with me. And, and, and it ain't over yet. You know, it's been going on for 50 years, but it's that shift in consciousness from being utterly self-centered to moving towards becoming God-centered. So we call this thing hitting bottom. We try to keep it simple, hey? Johnson says, the process can be summed up in one sentence. It is the relocating of the center of the personality from the ego to a center greater than oneself. Uh, Paul uh, had a classic uh, 
and, and, and he's quoted in um, William James and other literature. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Boom. That's a shift in the center. The Buddha sitting under, under the banyan tree. Why is there suffering? Why is there death? Why is there pain? And he comes away. Why am I, I, I clinging? Let go of the I. Scary, scary, but that's what it takes. So one sentence, the relocating of the center of the personality from the ego to a center greater than oneself. Now you don't, you don't lose the ego. It doesn't disappear, but it gets humbled. It gets rightly related to the greater self that is inside you, that is inside me, right? that has business with us. This sentence is absolutely key, so let, let's go through it kind of slowly. So here Johnson is talking about this shift from three-dimensional consciousness to four-dimensional consciousness, exact language that's used in the big book. That's why it grabbed my attention so much. So it's moving, as I said, from being centered in self to being centered, and that is drawing our deepest uh, sense of identity from a power greater than self. And he's explaining what Jung had discovered, that there are actually two very different and distinct centers of human consciousness. And we can, at different times, be centered in one or centered in the other. And, and we can shift back and forth between these two. And I believe that this is exactly what happens in two-way prayer, that I am listening. I am, I, 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 my ego is cooperating and it must cooperate. It must park its little butt, you know, for 20 minutes or so in the morning and allow the greater personality to speak, to take on form, and even to take notes. That's the role of the ego. But there's a different experience, a sense of who I am when this voice is coming through to me. And, and, and I know people out there who are doing two-way prayer have experienced exactly the same thing. You know? And it's not God sitting up on a cloud, whispering lovely words into your ear. It's the deepest part of you speaking to the part of you, the ego part, that is now cooperating and being in service to the greater self. Two selves that are happening here. The first self, uh, Johnson says, it's the small s self. This is ego consciousness. It, it, it's firmly centered in our waking, normal, day-to-day, -day, this is who I am kind of self. My name is Bill, and this is who I am. I've known myself for a long time, all right? <laughs> but I'm capable of more. So there's also a second self. And this Jung spells with a capital S, the greater self, the greater personality. All right, that resides within us, not outside of us. Well, outside too, <laughs> but, but our business is, is with it as it is manifesting itself in our consciousness. So uh, this is the center of far greater, more encompassing level of consciousness. Jung calls it sometimes the greater personality. And this center encompasses or includes the ego self. That's a part of it. But it also contains the unconscious, and it goes even broader than that to contain what Jung called the collective unconscious. That at some, and you guys know this, that at some level we are joined together. We may not have the words for this, you know, but at some level we are, we are one, O-N-E with a capital O. That's our greatest identity. And when we experience this, we are at great, great peace. Sometimes you get it when you see a sunset. 
and you are just in awe or a sunrise or at a meeting when someone just breaks down and your heart opens up to a new level that you didn't even know was there or you get ripped apart by life and you don't run you stay and you are changed by that experience this this is powerful stuff so this self capital s is by definition far greater than the smaller self and while the greater self can be experienced by the lesser self the lesser self is incapable of understanding it it's important can't understand it why because it is greater than the problem <laughs> the problem is that this lesser self can and often does think of itself above the greater self all right when, when when we say and we say it all the time in 12-step world hey eh? you're playing god well that's exactly what we're doing we are usurping taking on the role of the greater self the ego inflates so the big book is 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 so spot on when it says what the problem is self the problem is self-centeredness. We had to get rid of it or it killed us. That's the quote. We had to get rid of it. Well, you can, but you can't kill the ego. If you kill the ego, you go psychotic. So it is the ego that must go through a death, yes, but let it be a ritual death. Let it be a psychic death. Let it be a realigning death. It feels like death. It's not. It's not. It comes out the other end, transformed, changed, but always capable of reinflating. We got, we got to keep an eye on that. That'll be in the next quote we're going to come up against. So, um, Johnson Johnson names this different self. He says, this super personal center has been variously called the self. We just beat that one to death, capital S, called the Christ nature, the Buddha nature, super consciousness, cosmic consciousness, the Torah Samadhi. In 12-step terminology, we call it the higher power. We're not taking sides. We're just saying, listen, little one, <laughs> little ego, there must be a power greater than you, and you must come into right relationship with this greater power. All right? That's what the purpose of the steps is, to lead us through that transformation process. So in step two, is it possible there could be something greater than you? Well, it's possible. Good, you've done step two. Step three, turn your life and your will over to it, a ritual. And it was a ritual. They got down on their knees with, with someone else who had surrendered, and they said the words. Whether they meant them or not is not as important as saying them. Now, that's so important. Go through the ritual, and then be like me and live 50 years of watching it come to fruition. Yeah, I turned my life and my will over to, the, over to God. Did it stay there? No, but I did the ritual. Do the ritual. Do it once. Do it right. Okay? And then, steps what? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Clean up the mess that the ego has made. All right? Look at it. Watch it. See it. Own it. Share it. Six and seven, Wilson said, this is where he put the four absolutes. Honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. That, that's, that's the nature of the greater self. It is honest, it is pure, it is unselfish, it is loving. Am I those things? Not the little ego one, but those little things exist within me and they exist within you. And are they coming to fruition? Are they coming alive or are they not? Are they staying on the shelf? Eight and nine, uh, you make amends. And then 10, 11 and 12, 
is where this stuff comes to life. You know, not by meetings, 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 but by prayer and meditation that takes you deeper and deeper into self. And, and, and where you can experience this difference between the small self and the greater self. And I'm not knocking meetings, you know, they're really helpful. But in and of themselves, they're not going to bring it about. I'm sorry. That, 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 that was the belief in the early days, and it is now. And it's just like going to church ain't going to do this either, you know. Just going to church, just going through the motions. Is it helpful? Can be. If that's the level you're going to stay at, you're going to have what, what my first sponsor used to call a limited conversion. A not very deep psychic change. Now, I'll get in trouble for this, but 90% of the people in church, that's exactly what they've had. It's exactly what they have. They're operating at the level of... Um, superficiality, shall we say. And 90% of people in 12-step recovery are pretty much doing the same. And this isn't a numbers game. And I'm not here to change everybody. But if you're part of that 10% who isn't going to be satisfied with the other after a period of time, then you need to know this stuff. You need to know why, uh, you know, am I restless, irritable, and discontented? Because my soul is not aligned with the greater self. That's the work. That's the work of recovery. This relocation appears to be death when viewed from the perspective of the ego. So Johnson warns us, be prepared for a fight. Be prepared for, like in my case, 50 years of this stuff. And that's what they warned me of. Bill, you know, this, this is not like I gave my life to Jesus and it's just been wonderful ever since. Good luck. <laughs> it's it's going to be daily encounters of the lesser self with the greater self. And let's see who wins each day, hey? All right? So the, the, the ego, the lesser self, has a tendency to inflate, to be large and in charge. You watch it. And you'd better watch it, all right? So, uh, and that that's why step 10, 11, and 12, daily, daily, watch, watch, pray, act. 10, watch. 11, pray, get guidance. 12, act. Johnson, let's go back to him. It says, Zen masters observe that Satori, their term for a non-personal center of consciousness, can be viewed by the ego as nothing but total disaster, and death it is. The ego loses its supremacy and goes through a short time of violent suffering. While the inflated ego views the encounter with the self initially as a defeat, simultaneously it is also an opportunity for transformation or psychic change to occur. Remember one fellow saying, uh, you know, when, when a new person comes into the meeting and they have been ripped open by life and they are in such suffering and pain, they are at an opportunity for marvelous wisdom because that ego has been knocked down. Now, does it have to get knocked down all the way? I don't think it does. But be prepared for, for an encounter with the divine to feel like a succession of deaths. And I think it is. I think it is. But greater life at the other side. Greater life, greater joy. Once I've been freed from the bondage of self, the bondage. This self stuff is a prison, the big book says. We got to get out of that prison. How? By rightly relating this smaller self to the greater self. Johnson, when someone threatens suicide at this time, I caution him that he must be very careful to do it without harming his body. 
suicide is not the answer, but it is an indication of the struggle that's going on inside. And to kill the body is not to find the solution. It's, it's to de-inflate the ego. That's the solution. And I think the next series I'm going to do is on Harry Tebow, uh, his, his ego deflation at depth, some of, some of his early work. He was a psychiatrist for Bill Wilson and the first psychiatrist to really grasp what the hell's going on in AA. And, and he wrote some marvelous little pamphlets, uh, articles that I, I had to read a hundred times because they were putting into words what was happening inside of me in my first year of recovery. And I didn't understand it. But I was so damn happy to find somebody who did. Somebody who could say, oh, this is what's going on. All right, this is what's happening. A Zen master in Los Angeles, I can't remember if I just read this or not, once said to his client, why don't you die now and enjoy the rest of your life? In other words, you must go through the process. Kill the right self, right? <laughs> Get it right size and then enjoy the rest of your life. That's the invitation. So the ego must be dethroned. It must give up, surrender, let go. All the words we used, it must abdicate its central place within the psyche so that the needed shift in consciousness can occur. Johnson adds, this work is best done by the ego. What does he mean by that? He means that the ego has a necessary cooperative role that it must play within the drama. It cannot will the shift to happen. You can't just say, okay, I'm, this is what I want to happen. Go ahead. It, this is not, it can't be done that way. But it can become willing. Right? And it can then allow it to happen. So the ego needs to stay the course. It must continue. It must endure, it must persist, it must not run away from the encounter. And it, if it does this, if it shows up humble, right sized then in time, it is rewarded. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, they, the promised changes, will materialize if we work for them. In other words, keep coming back until the miracle happens, keep coming back to the program, Keep coming back to prayer. People say, well, you know, I've, I've, I've done this two-way prayer thing for a year or two. I got an email just today uh, telling me that. Well, I, I get those all the time, you know. Oh, am I done? <laughs> Stick around, more will be revealed. You know, that ego is going to pop up again and, and try to assume uh, control. So it's constant vigilance, constant watchfulness. And, and the better you get at it, the more rewards you're going to get. Now, I knew, I knew two things, so grateful for this when I first got sober. I've mentioned this before, I think. Uh, the first was, do not take the first drink. That is not God's will. And the second thing I knew was, do not run. And damn, did I want to run. I wanted that easier, softer way. And I had to endure. I had to stay so much maybe more at the beginning that is so necessary you know can you get that one year can you get that five years they say if you get five years 95 percent of us stay stay sober but you got to get that five years and how do you do it you stay and if you're doing prayer and meditation two-way prayer or any other kind you stay you sit on your damn pillow you know put in the time it's like going to the gym you know if you stay, you will change. If not, you know, off we go. Uh, yeah, I've kind of summed this summed this up in, in one sentence. That this is this is mine, uh, but I think it, it, it captures what Johnson is saying here. So briefly, what, what we need to do is to kill the self that's killing the self with a capital S. Kill the little s that's killing the greater s. So we can become the self that we're each intended to be. I'll read that again. We need to kill the self, small s, that's killing the self, large s, so we can, we, we can become the self, large s, we're each intended to be.
That's the psychic change. There is one more uh, of Johnson's quote, but I thought it'd be too much to have read the first time. So let me let me go into it. When the dark night begins to lift, one morning, there's an unaccountable touch of joy in the air. This is the first contact with the four dimensional consciousness, and one can begin to live from that source of energy. Something of the subtle inner world becomes your center of gravity, poetry, music, a new perceptiveness when you are jogging, a bit of the pink cloud, all right? But it is energizing. You feel the power. Why? Because the greater self has 100,000 watts of electricity, you know, and we're little 110s and 220s at the best. And now we're plugged into this. And if we stay plugged in and allow it to pass through us, it's marvelous. It's fourth dimensional stuff. If, however, we start to grasp for it and control it and assume it for ourselves, look out, you're going to be destroyed. That's, this, this, is, this, this, is, this is where Johnson is heading. So this realignment uh, of the lesser self with the greater self brings a tremendous amount of relief. Stop fighting everything and everyone. We don't die physically, but we do die psychically or spiritually. The inflation, whoosh, the air comes out of our balloon. And this allows us entry into the fourth dimensional consciousness, provides us with new energy, new vision, new purpose and meaning to our lives. Prayer and meditation become our principal means for maintaining this conscious contact with this new source of love, of energy, of wisdom that is streaming into us and ready to guide our lives. So, but less, lest our egos inflate again, which they will, Johnson adds a realistic and important note of caution. He says, less worthy channels for this new energy are fanaticism, dictatorial religious beliefs, and ego inflations of all kinds. And if that ain't what you see in religious groups and in 12-step Nazis, in people who uh, know the words but are not in touch with the spirit, that's what you're going to see. And this is why you'll see people with 20, 30 years go out and blow it. Why? Because they lost contact with the energy. And you see it with people who are, um, you know, sir, not all, but so many circuit speakers are up there doing a show, putting on a performance. And you see the same damn thing in so many churches, you know, and, and, and then you watch them crater. Why do they crater? You know, all, all these, you know, people on TV who are, you know, Jesus saves and all of this nonsense, you know, send me money, you know, <laughs> well, watch, watch and see what happens. Power corrupts. And this power must be used wisely. And it must be used for the sake of others. And if you try to take it on for yourself, the grandiosity, the inflation will begin to puff up again. It's what's going to happen. Johnson says, if the new energy flows into such channels, I love this line, you are quickly sent back for further boiling in the oil of transformation. Just have this vision of a pot out there in the middle of the jungle, you know? <laughs> and it's like, okay, you get inflated, Put your ass back in that pot and you're going to boil for a while. In what? In the oil of transformation. What a beautiful expression that is. It's, you know, um, and, and, and I've been sent back to that pot a thousand times. 
And, and, and anybody who's honestly working a program has as well, where, where, where the, you reinflate, you know, I do Wordle in the New York Times last three uh, days. I've, I've gotten it in two. You watch my e. Oh, God is finally appreciating who's doing this damn Wordle. It's moi. <laughs> Look out. Take out the garbage. You know, get that ego back in check. Five or six green lights. And it's, it's like the Red Sea is parting in front of me. And this is normal. This is human. But it's human in conscious connection with the divine. We have business with the divine. And I'm a firm believer the divine has real business with us. Can the divine incarnate within ourselves? That's what the divine wants to do. Wants to do it with you. If, you know, and, and exactly in the circumstances where you are at, not, not on some holy mountaintop, right where you are, right where you are, right where I am, have an opportunity, have it every morning. Will it happen or will it not happen? It's the question. More will be revealed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, spiritual journeys, I, I just don't think they ever lead in, a, in an exact straight line. They're marked by times of great joy and times of deep desolation as, as well. Each one has its uh, purpose. Alcoholics and addicts, we often get labeled, you know, manic depressives. Well, be very careful. There is a manic side to this thing. It's, it's what Johnson was describing. And there's a depressive side to this thing. And the depression has as much to teach us as the manic side, you know, using those in extremes. But Jung said, after midlife, success has nothing to teach a man. We learn, we learn through further boiling in the oil of transformation. It's not the only way we can learn. We have that opportunity every day. And this is, I love a quote by Richard Rohr. Two things powerful enough to change a person. Pain or prayer. Most people choose pain. <laughs> Doesn't have to be. Just seems to be the way it is, guys. I know that's heavy stuff, but I think it, it really goes to the core of, uh, of, of what happens in 12-step recovery, of what happens in two-way prayer, of what happens in psychic change. So uh, I think I will go ahead and uh, get out my copy of Harry Tebow and see what he has to say on some of this subject. So maybe we'll do three or four more sessions on uh, some of this core stuff and uh, see if we can uh, understand it uh, in a better way because it's central to what recovery is all about. All right, I'm going to shut up. I thank you guys for listening. I hope it was helpful. If it was, send me a note, twowayprayer at gmail.com, uh, and look forward to hearing from you. So thanks so much. God bless. Keep coming back. Mm -hmm.